Ephesians chapter number 4. Begin reading verse number 1. The Apostle Paul writes, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you are called, with all lowliness and meekness and with longsuffering, forbearing one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. Now, by chapter number 4, the Apostle Paul has already covered a whole bunch. And then, we start chapter number 4 and he says, I therefore, in other words, because of everything in chapters 1 through 3 we don't have time to get through all that but because of what he had just talked and preached to them about in chapters 1 through 3 he delivers them this charge in chapter number 4 he says I therefore the prisoner of the Lord beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you are called now that word vocation used to back in the day that meant a living Right? It wasn't a job. Nowadays they use the word career. But a vocation was something that you learned that you could live off of. Right, The thing that made it a vocation and not just a hobby is that your skill in it right, or the demand for whatever it was that you had learned how to do could support you and your family. Well, here the Apostle Paul talking about the vocation. What vocation were we called to? Well, we were saved. But that wasn't the vocation. The vocation that you were given after you were saved was to be an ambassador for the Lord Jesus Christ. Right? He made you a new creature so that you would no longer look like the world, act like the world, smell like the world, walk like the world. Right? So that you could be robed in His righteousness and go forth to deliver the gospel unto the world. He made you different to fulfill the vocation that He called you to. We are servants, right? Well, what, how, how do we serve? Well, everyone may serve in a different capacity. We'll get to that. In fact, He talks about that later on in this chapter. Right? That God's grace was given out different to each person according to the gifts that God had given them. Right? We all fulfill a role, but what is the overarching vocation? We serve as ambassadors. We are no longer of this. We're in the world, not of it. Right? We're pilgrims and strangers passing through. But an ambassador represents the person that's in him. That is our vocation. Right? And I assure you, you can make a living off of it. Right? It's something that has to be learned. Right? When we got saved, Brother Phil, we didn't know you know, all the verses or all the doctrine on what God wanted us to be. We just knew that He wanted us to be like Him. Right? That desire is enough to get somebody into the book to figure out how God wants them to change. Holy Ghost is going to show you what God wants you to work on. Right? But for what purpose? So that as an ambassador, we go out. Keep in mind, first part of the verse, He says, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord. He's in bonds as He's writing this. In fact, before this, the Apostle Paul tells them, hey, don't want you all to be discouraged, don't want you all to be... Fro He's saying, it's the perfect will of God right now for me to be in prison. Perfect will of God that I'm not a free man. How did the Apostle Paul have that... Well, one, he knew that he wasn't going to die before he went and saw Caesar because God told him he had to go stand before Caesar. But also, the Apostle Paul understood that through trials, the world sees something affect us and they know how it affects other people. Right in the book of Ecclesiastes, there's nothing new under the sun. We know you get sick, you get sick. You get really sick, you might die. Right? We know what it's like for people, and the world knows what it's like for people, right, to not know where their next meal is going to come from. Right? There are certain things that we just know. They're going to happen. People lose a job, there's going to be hardship. Especially unexpectedly. Right? Does anybody remember 2008? Housing bubble burst. All of a sudden, a whole lot of construction workers that were building houses hand over fist, now they're not building any. The right? world remembers what that's like. Okay? Well, when that hardness hits somebody that's an ambassador of a different country, they react different. They live different. 
the tools of their vocation caused them to live in such a way that they represent Christ and that what he's put in them is greater than anything in the world. Our vocation is to live as an ambassador, not to claim the title. Right? What good is a title without any of the responsibility? He says that you live worthy of the vocation wherewith we're called. What does that mean? We do what he expects, which is our best. Are we going to fail? Absolutely. Are we going to have moments where we trip and stuff? Yeah. But somebody that walks worthy of it realizes just because they messed up here, it doesn't mean they can't keep going. They get back to what they should be and keep pressing on. Right? If they fall in the mud, they don't leave the muddy clothes on. They go get changed. Right? They go see the master and say, Master, I fell in the, you know, horrible situation. But see, our master, knowing all, he's got the wardrobe change ready. He said, he's faithful. That if we confess our sins, be faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. Always there, willing to forgive. Why? So that we can go and be a worthy ambassador. Well, then verse number two. He tells us how we're supposed to walk. With lowliness and meekness. That didn't the song we just sang about? That the only thing that we ought to brag in is what? The cross of Christ. All pride and all humility laid at the door. That we're an ambassador of a different country, but we have nothing that we can claim that we did to become a citizen of that nation. Right? We're not somebody going out and telling somebody how great it is to live in our house. No, 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 no. We're not telling them that we built something that they need to come see. We're not the barker at the outside of the carnival saying, hey, come look at all the stuff that I gathered for you all to see. Six-foot man eating chicken. It's a dude standing on a stool eating a bucket of KFC. Right? That was in the Little Rascals movie. Right? It's not about what we've done. No, we walk with all lowliness and meekness. This fine apparel that I wear is not because I made it. It's not because I bought it. It was given to me by one who altogether lovely. Taste and see that he's good. But see, lowliness is a trait that they attributed to Christ. It's what the prophets prophesied that he would be, that he would be meek and lowly. But it doesn't mean that you let people walk all over you. In fact, most ambassadors, if you were to take their flag and stomp on it, they would have a very volatile reaction. It may not come to blows, but they certainly would let you know why what you just did was a great insult to them. Right? They wouldn't stand for it. They wouldn't allow it to happen again. They safeguard the things that are precious to them. In fact, one of the things with U.S. embassies all around the globe, as long as that U.S. flag is still hanging over top of it, there can be nobody in it. But as long as, I can't remember which side it's on, I think it was over here. As long as red, white, and blue is still flying, that's U.S. soil. Doesn't matter if there's nobody there from the U.S., they guard it and they protect it like it's U.S. soil. When, he's, when they leave, if they decide that they're pulling out, guess what the last thing they do is? They lower the flag and they take it with them. Why? Because it's a symbol of the fact that that was precious and owned by the U.S. But when the flag comes down, they're saying, we're taking the flag with us. You can't have it. It means something to us. Well, what are you saying, Brother George? Meek and lowly right, is a attribute it is not a character what are we supposed to well, the apostle Paul talks about in this book that God gave him boldness to go out and deliver the gospel you can be meek and lowly but still have boldness your character is what your vocation we ought to be a representative well as a representative okay let's go back to them embassies you know who guards the U.S. embassies around the world? Marines. 
You want to know what the Marines on duty at a U.S. Embassy do? Same thing that every other soldier does. Their uniform has to be pristine. It's not wrinkled. Why? Because they're representing the place that they're from. A lot of times they never have meetings. In fact, very rarely, I guarantee you. They're not asking, you know, old Jarhead what he thinks about international politics. Right? He never says anything except don't go there. Halt. Let me see some ID. Right? But he says a whole lot with what? His uniform. He cares about his post. Where, where's he at? Where he's supposed to be? What's he doing? Keeping watch. What do you know about that soldier just from looking at him as a representative of somebody that's guarding the embassy? You know that he takes his job serious? You know that what he's guarding is important to him? You know that he doesn't just let anybody inside of them walls? And you know that he would lay down his life trying to protect it? So you could be meek and lowly, not offend somebody, right? present the gospel in a way that's compassionate and with love, but they can look at the way that you dress, they can look at the way that you are behaving and know you take it very serious. You don't stand for somebody trampling underneath of their feet what is very precious to you. Didn't Jesus drive the money changers out of the temple with the three-quartered whip that he made? But yet, he was still meek and lowly. Didn't do it out of anger. What did he do? It was called righteous indignation. It was the right thing to do. And he did it the way that it could be done. If he had walked in and asked them to leave, they'd have laughed at him. They'd have mocked him. But what did he... He purposed that they weren't going to treat his father's house that way. And he knew that the only thing they were going to react to was being driven out, not being escorted out. Right, go to the tomb of the unknown soldier and try and cross that velvet rope. Not going to happen. Why? Because that man was given a charge. Nobody over that line. In fact, I think there's a couple of YouTube videos where idiots have tried to do that. Didn't end well for them. Why didn't it end well for him? Because that man, as an ambassador, he's guarding the tomb of those that have no idea. We don't know who they are, but yet they gave their life for us. So they show him the ultimate respect of guarding their tomb 24-7. In fact, they've identified a few of them over the years. Some of them will probably never be identified because, you know, getting people that were related to somebody from 1918 and the First World War, right? Kind of challenging. And then certainly comparing it to somebody nowadays. But what do we... What we say? They take it very serious. In fact, you never hear them say anything until the changing of the guard where they report their orders and give them to the next guard. But they'll let you know when you cross the line. He said, you don't have to go out there, preach everything that you believe to every person, start arguing with people. Right? You can be meek and lowly, still be dressed right. You'll be identified with those that say, because that's what a uniform does. Right? A uniform makes everybody uniform. Makes them the same. Well, guess what everybody in the military has on their uniform? Over here, it's a little backwards flag. It's backwards because you can't copyright the American flag. That's a fun fact for you. So, they turned it around backwards. Anyway, don't have time to get into that. Random history facts from Jordan. Things he forgot he knew. What do you think? All of them are associated with where they come from. In fact, they got patch right over here. Usually says U.S. and then Army or U.S. Marines, Navy, Air Force. 
everything about them says that's where they're from you don't have to ask them you know by what they're wearing how they act but that y'all ever been somewhere heard a cashier say sir you in the military he's not in uniform but why the way that he carries himself usually the haircut that he has and he's usually pretty polite back in the day when I used to rock a flat top because I wanted to be like my grandpa and I think I still had that up into like high school or something they'd say do you want to go in the military no ma'am did get an author, offer from West Point but guess what happened my mom said she'd kill me if I signed up so anyway West Point was out the window I was like yeah but I'll be a, an officer by the time I get out didn't matter to her Listen, you don't have to ask somebody in uniform where they're from what they stand for you know he's saying you can still be bold have lines that people if they cross them you can let them know while still being meek and lowly then he goes on to say with long suffering part of meek and lowly is knowing when people don't know better when suffering the wrong looking for God to open the door to where they'll be receptive for it you guys ever see during some of them riots and everything where maybe not the US but these officers I mean we can look at all the stuff that happened during COVID where people thought oh we've got nothing better to do let's just go burn everything down right those police officers that were told to stand on the line guess what they did stood on the line even when things were being thrown at them people yelling and screaming in their faces but were, they were long suffering but brother Jordan how do you know they were being long suffering because if it was me I'd have clocked the dude right but they knew all that would do would cause more unrest so what they do they stood there face to face and took it now to what extent they knew eventually cooler heads would prevail but they also purposed that they weren't going to let that angry mob behind them to do more damage but are we not called soldiers we do have the sword but see this doesn't cut flesh what's it cut to it cuts to the heart this won't destroy a man but it will show him where he's wrong all of our weapons are spiritual weapons but yet we have armor to protect us why because we're supposed to stand there long suffering showing them we've got the answer but we won't let you destroy those things which are sacred then it goes on does not just long suffer forbearing one another now he's saying not just being long suffering to others he's talking about in the church one another one another means that you're part of the same thing we're not a part of anything that the world's a part of so who's the others of one another that's the rest of the church you know what forbearing means pretty close to long suffering means that you put up with something that you don't feel like putting up with not for your own benefit but for somebody else's brings back remembrance of the passage of scripture where it says that the Lord winks at our ignorance he forbears it why because he understands that we don't know no better he understands that our feeble attempts are never enough but he honors that we're willing to labor for him that the inkling that we do understand from the word that the spirits taught us because the word spiritually discerned right all that we do know God taught it to us and the little bit that we do know still we can't wrap our minds around it right those that think well I know exactly what God's trying to do really truly because his ways are above our ways in fact his ways are above finding out Right? all we know is what God tells us 
And by faith, we know he's got the rest of it in control. But see, now we're talking about one another. Right? We forbear one another. God made you the way that God made you. Right? And there are pet peeves that I have. Okay? Right, wrong, or indifferent. I got to look the other way sometimes. Right? Nothing right, wrong, or indifferent about it. It's just something that maybe I don't like. Who cares? We're not here to be happy and, you know, everybody to do the exact... We're not robots. You know why we're here? To worship God. Right? So what if somebody comes in talking about something that I don't think that they should talk about? I forbear it and keep my mind on worshiping. I don't approach them about it because approaching them may put them in a bad spirit may ruin the rest of the service for everybody else. I forbear it. I take it as a burden and say, Lord, I understand that people are different. Why do you think that he said, you know, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of your faith, you're going to find things you don't like about other people. You start looking long enough, you're going to find that, well, I don't like the way that person parts their hair. Who cares? It's not your hair. Right? Or, I don't like the way that that person does this, that, or the other. But does it get the same job done? Who cares? We're not here to look at others. We're here to look at Him. Right? We're supposed to labor with one another. Are we not one body fitly framed together? Right? I cannot labor with somebody else if I'm nitpicking everything that they do. I forbear it. As long as we're pulling in the same direction, plow's going to move. Doesn't matter how you hold on to the rope and I hold on to the rope. The only thing is, is that we're laboring for the Lord together. Right? Who cares how that person prays? You talk to God the way that you talk to God. I guarantee you this, He hears both of you. Why? Because He promised. He also promised that we ask anything in Jesus. That's the only requirement. There's the model prayer that Jesus gave us on how we ought to pray. Right? But what did Jesus set forth? That we ought to honor God. We ought to thank God. We ought to, by faith, believe that God will provide the needs that He promised that He'd take care of. Then we're supposed to, then there's intercessory supplication. Right? How do we round it all out? He said, if we ask anything of the Father in His name, that He'd do it. So by faith, you meet them requirements, doesn't matter how you talk to God. Now, I believe you should talk to God like He's your best friend. Why? Because He is. He's a friend that's sticking closer than a brother. I believe you should honor and revere Him because He's the Lord of Lord and King of Kings. But He's also the person that's closest to you. Nobody else can get any closer. There should be a familiarity there. What are you saying, Brother John? Why are you listening to somebody else pray anyway? Aren't you supposed to be praying? I mean, that's, this is why people don't come talk to me about these things. Well, why were you listening? Shouldn't you have been praying? But what did we forbear one another? So what if something you said gets on my nerves? You didn't mean anything by it. I should be grown enough to not let it bother me. We forbear one another. For what purpose? Endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. You know the most sacred thing that any called out body of believers that nowadays people call church? Right? You know the most sacred thing that the church has been entrusted with? There are the ordinances of God that the church was entrusted with. Right? But why were the ordinances delivered so that the church could do what God intended the church to do? Okay, but what keeps a church a church? The bond of the Spirit. Or the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. You know what started that church? God wanted to start it. You know what that means? God's going to keep it together. You know what happens when that unity has gone? It's not a church no more. They may call themselves a church. They may come out and they may assemble. But Ichabod's been stamped on the door. The glory has departed. There's no unity there anymore put together by God. There's just people that choose to be associated with one another. 
That's why I like that thing hanging on the wall over there so much. First line. Having been led as we believe by the Holy Spirit. You know what that means? The reason that I'm a member here is because I believe God wants me to be a member here. I believe it's the will of God for me to be here and nowhere else. And you know what the last paragraph says? That if God ever moves me anywhere else, as soon as I leave here, I'll join the church that God wants me to join. Why? Because I'm not here because I like it. Now, don't get me wrong. I like it. But I like it because it's where I'm supposed to be and that's where God put me. I'd be miserable if I was here and God didn't want me to be here. Right? In fact, let me just throw out this. If God didn't want me here and I still got up and taught Sunday school, you wouldn't get anything out of it. Because it wasn't God's will for me to be teaching. It's God from, God's will for me to be somewhere else. Right? Well, what do we... Why do we forbear? Why are we lowly and meek one to another? Why are we long-suffering one to another? Right? Two, get to verse number three. We endeavor to keep the unity of the Spirit. You know what an endeavor is? An endeavor is something that is monumental. It's a big task. But yet you set out on it anyway. Because it's worth doing. An endeavor is something that it's going to take you a lifetime of work to do it. An endeavor is something that you just don't do on the side on the weekends. An endeavor is something that consumes your life. Now keep in mind, verse number one, he talks walking worthy of the vocation wherewith we are called. We're called to be an ambassador. But how can you be an ambassador of something that you're not a part of? We endeavor to keep the unity of the Spirit because unless the Spirit's working and moving, we don't have an, anything to be an ambassador of. Right? God gave the church. It's what He died for, according to your Bible. He died for the church. It's so precious to Him that he calls it the bride of Christ. Right? It's what he went to go prepare a place for and one day he's coming back to get. We are ambassadors of a church. Now who founded the church? Jesus. He paid for it with his blood. Who called us all together? The Holy Spirit. Why? Because Jesus saved us and wanted us to be a part of a local body of believers. Right? But this is our embassy. We go out of here to be ambassadors. Why do you think our pastor says if anything that bypasses the local church he doesn't want to be a part of? Because God endeavored, or God intended for us to endeavor out of a local church. If it bypasses the local church, God don't want anything to do with it. Why? Because he gave the church, told us to be members of that church, and then, verse number 3, he wants us to dwell in unity of the Spirit, capital S. Why did He give the church? So that we could be a body. Can't be a body unless you have unity. But it's not the unity of man. Right? We didn't. I don't know how it was when you joined the church. Right? But there was no collective, okay, well let's sit down and what do you believe? How do you believe? Right? It was a we believe this is what God wants us to believe wants to be. I've been saved, been baptized into a local church according to the gospel. I mean according to the scriptures. And I want to be a member of this church because I believe this is where God wants me to be. And that's it. But it wasn't a okay, I agree that they could be a member of the church. Do you agree? Do you agree? Do you agree? Do you agree? No, it's not a handshake association. It's not a welcome to the club. You didn't have to know the secret password or the you know secret hand sign. Right? It wasn't a test of intellect. There are clubs like that out there. Right? You've got to have a certain IQ before you can apply. And then you may not even get in. Right? It's not a, well, we all like knitting, so we started a club. 
No, the thing that keeps us together is the Spirit of God. What drew you to be a member? The Spirit of God. What directs you that you should still be a member? The Spirit of God. What unifies us? Not anything of mortal hands. Right? It's not the title, Emmanuel Baptist Church, that keeps us together. What keeps us together? That kindred spirit that the Bible talks about. That the spirit that lives in me tells me that you got the same spirit that I got and that we're brethren. Why do you think we call each other brother, sister? Because we're all in the same family. Right? But there's a whole bunch of other people all across this globe. Right? Each one of them missionaries up on that board. Some of them more than one church. But all the people in them churches, we're still brother and sister with them. But they're not a part of this body. Right? It's not even a familiar relationship that keeps us together. What makes this group of brother and sister stick together? The Spirit. You know why some churches, when they go out and they do things, seems like God's all over it. The other churches, seems like God doesn't do anything. Because some people go out unified. And some people just go out because they know they're supposed to go out. See, if you have unity, it's not out of obligation. It's out of joy. Some ambassadors go because somebody tells them to. Other people ask to go because they have a passion for it. Because where they want to go is special to them. That they're invested in what's going on over yonder and they want to be the one that gets to go and be a representative to those people what are you saying brother Jordan some people are unified what's that mean well according to your Bible it's the will of God that we all have one spirit one doctrine right, hang on right, verse number 4 only one body one spirit even as you're called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. What does that mean? There's a lot of ones out there. There's one faith. Which one? The one that Jesus lived. There's one way, one truth, one life. We know all those things. Well, unity is more than just agreeing on those things. It's not saying, well, we believe the same way because of the Spirit. But if you're in unity, you'll believe the same way. Not talking about personal convictions. That's something for you personally. We're talking about beliefs that the church holds. Doctrine. We'll be in agreement. But that's not unity. Because you can believe the same thing that everybody else believes, but that doesn't mean that you're going to have fellowship. Doesn't mean that you're going to be unified. So if it's not family... And if it's not what you believe, but what, what is it that he's talking about here? That unity of the Spirit. You see, he's not just talking about when we come out to worship. Because there's people that aren't members of revival coming up. I guarantee you there are going to be some people, not members of our church, show up. Guess what? They're going to be able to worship with us. Right? They're going to be able to get in just like we get in. Right? But they're not unified in this local church. They can have fellowship with us, but they're not part of us. Why? Because the thing that sticks us together, it's not what we believe, it's not how we dress, it's not how we talk, it's not how we walk. The thing that unifies us is that God put the same burden in your heart that he put in everybody else's heart that's a member of this church. The reason that we stick together is because God purposed in you that you need to be here for a reason. Right? The thing that keeps us together is that the vision or the burden that God put on the pastor's heart he gives to the rest of us. Now the pastor is supposed to lead us, direct us. He is the under shepherd. Right? But you know why we're unified and follow him? Because we all got the same passion that God gave him. Why? Because God gave it to you. The Holy Spirit doesn't bind with bonds that we can discern or understand, but somehow along the way, right, 
Bible says fitly framed together. That means he took you because he knew that only you could be a part in the way that you could be a part. And either with thread and needle or some operation, he stitched you in. And only God can take you out. But we are bound by the Spirit, but that doesn't mean that we have unity. You ever been attached to something that you didn't want to be attached to? Right? You had a bond, but you weren't in unity. You ever see people try and do them three-legged races? Right? They're attached, but they don't always work in unity. When you say it's different being a part, right? Being attached to, being a piece of. And being bound or unified by the Spirit. Okay, we have a bond. What's that mean? We're stuck. Well, what should that bond be? Well, verse number three tells us. It should be a bond of peace. We are not unified, as later on you'll find in other epistles, where apostles write that there was warring within their members. What's that? They were bound but they weren't in peace. If the Spirit unifies you, there will be a bond of peace. We're together, but we're together peacefully. Is he not the Prince of Peace? So why wouldn't his church be a place of peace? But yet some people are kicking and bucking, and what's that do? We're not unified in the Spirit no more. They're still a part because God put them here but if they don't want to do it unified under the spirit guess what God's going to move them get rid of them because they don't share a bond of peace some people come because they've got a bond of you know obligation some people come because they've got a bond of well my family drags me some people come because they've got a bond of fellowship that all they want to do is hang out with people. But if you're unified in the Spirit, people come because they want to come, because they want to worship. People show up for visitation because they have the unity that it's important to get the gospel out, and they want to go and reach people. Right? Without the unification of the Spirit here, when you go to be an ambassador on your own, you're not going to have any unction. You're not going to have any impact. You're not going to look any different because you're not unified with the people that live different, act different, because God made them something different. You've got to be unified with what God wants you to be in order to represent what you ought to when you go out there. Keep in mind, he says, walk worthy of the vocation. Well, in order to walk worthy of the vocation, you've got to be associated in the right spirit with the right crowd. Look at Jonah. Jonah was where he was supposed to be. All right, go study it out. Chapter number one. Don't know where Jonah was when God called him, but it, God wouldn't have called to Jonah and told him to go if Jonah wasn't where Jonah was supposed to be. Show me where God calls to somebody, tells them to go when they're out of the will of God. So he was where he was supposed to be, which means he was around the right people. Probably had a lot of unity. There, but you go and you find out Jonah fled he knew he wasn't going to do what God wanted him to do but why did he leave because he knew that he had a bond with those people he knew not going to where God wanted him to go was going to bring God's judgment and he didn't want it to impact the people that he was close with he broke that bond and then later on storm starts raging out on the ocean Jonah tells him hey I'm a servant of the Most High God. And they said, Oh, we don't mess with him. And he said, God said, You throw me off the boat, y'all gonna live. And they said, We don't want to kill somebody. But he said, It's not your fault, my fault. So, they, I mean, they all made vows unto God, We'll do what you said, but please don't hold an innocent man's blood on our hands. They didn't know that he's gonna be okay, that God had prepared a great fish. But it says from that day forward they went on and they honored and reverenced God. 
Even people that he wasn't associated with were paying the price. Well, he's like, you can be in the right place around the right people and not have the right spirit. If Jonah didn't have the right spirit, why? Because he didn't want to go to Nineveh. In fact, even after he gets there and he does what God tells him to do, he's angry that God forgave him. Then you'd think that if he hated all them people so much, when God finally destroyed the city, you'd think that he'd you know, been happy about it. He wasn't even, he was miserable. He's going to go out and sit out in the sun until he died. God had to make a pumpkin plant grow up over top of him and give him some shade. Or gourd. Pumpkin type, type of gourd. I don't know what kind it was. But God had to give him shade. Throughout all of it, how did he do it? Out of obligation. I mean, it's a story that even if you're faithful, when you don't want to be, God can bless it. But, how much more if Jonah would have went willingly with the right spirit? What if after they all got right, he taught the next generation what was right? Because he wanted to, because he was invested. Maybe none of us still be around to this day. I don't know. But I can tell you this much. Just because you're in the right place at the right time, right in the will of God, doesn't mean that you're going to have the right spirit. The thing that holds us together isn't that we know where we ought to be and that we should be here and that we believe that God wants us to be here. The thing that keeps us unified is that we have a spirit in us that God says we ought to have. You know when we have unity here? When you have unity in here. If your spirit isn't lined up with the spirit of God, you're not going to be unified with God's people. To have a unity of the spirit outwardly, we must have it inwardly. To be unified in his spirit means that our wants are what his wants are. Our focus is where his focus is. Right? Our endeavor that thing that seems insurmountable but we've decided it needs to be done so we're going to do it what is that to reach a lost and dying world but it's not an easy thing for a whole bunch of people to get together with one mind in one accord and go out and do something it's a super act, supernatural act of God by nature people don't get along with people you get more than two people together you're liable to have a disagreement even with two, you're not going to see eye to eye on everything in the flesh. But it is a supernatural... Well, where does that start? Supernaturally, he works on your spirit to make you into something that you didn't used to be. You know why we can forbear one another? Because we understand it's not important about what the flesh thinks. Not important about what my ego thinks. What's important is that we're fitly framed together. We're long-suffering because we know I'm not perfect. I'll bear their burdens. The Bible does say if we bear one of those burdens, we so fulfill the law of Christ. But I'll even bear their burdens being long-suffering. I will suffer for a long time because I understand every now and then I need a little bit of time for God to teach me what I ought to do. That on occasion, I can be a little stubborn. That on occasion... Right, God has to give me the chastening rod before I realize that I was wrong and get back to the Father's house. Now I can be here, but spirit, we're talking spiritually. But if I break unity with the Spirit, it may take me a minute to get back. Right, is it because it's a long journey? No, it's because I'm hard-headed. But if we're unified with the Spirit, we don't look at those and see, wait, we're, we don't mark that. But what's Martha? Lord, I got to do all this cooking. Tell her to come help me. Martha had the right spirit. She would have forbore it. She'd had a little bit of long suffering because she knew that Mary was getting exactly what Mary needed and that she may not have that opportunity again. So she'd have kept her mouth shut because she knew that's the best for Mary. Right? Sure. If it's easy, anybody would do it. Right, if the burdens were light, everybody would carry them. 
If long suffering was easy, it wouldn't be called long suffering. And if forbearing was easy, you wouldn't have to bear it. You'd just be able to shrug it off. It takes work to be unified. But most of it is a spiritual work that can't be done with human hands. You know how you have unity with the Spirit? You fellowship with Him. You talk with Him. You ask Him to teach you what you ought to be reading. You ask Him to direct you in your daily paths. Right? Eventually it looks like what's well, hanging on that banner out yonder. Pray without ceasing. In the hallway. Constant lines of communication open with God. Don't get there overnight. But He did promise right, that He'd keep working on us if we yielded and allowed Him to do it. So if we want to walk worthy, what do we, we got to be unified. Because unless we're unified, we can't be identified with anything. Our identity is not in a building, in the name that's on the building. Our identity comes from the fact that we are unified in one cause, which is what living like God wanted us to live. Being that new creature. Being preoccupied with the things that He told us to be preoccupied with and ignoring those things which the world think are all the glitz, all the glam, all the rage. Right? And focusing on what's really important. But if we're not unified when we go out, people are going to say, what's that uniform? Never seen that before. Right? That guy's just playing dress up. He doesn't really have a position. Right? Nobody sent him. He just came on his own. But because there's no place, there's no base of operation that people can look to and say, oh, he came from over there. You want to know why the modern world doesn't know what a Christian looks like? Because not many unified churches have been sending out ambassadors. The world knows what a church member looks like, but they don't know what an ambassador of Christ looks like. The world knows what a Baptist looks like. But in fact, a lot of people tell you a lot of bad things about Baptists, and here's the thing, I believe most of them. You see, people have been trying to unify under all the wrong things when all along they should have just been unified in the Spirit. But I can't keep everybody here in agreement. You know who can? God. We've got a great pastor. Don't care which pastor it is. No pastor can keep everybody, you know, unified. That takes the act of God. Right? If... God thought that the pastor could do it, then the pastor would go out and recruit people to be members of the church. No, God sends members of the church because God unified them with us. But see, then a lot of people mistake membership with unity. We have a bond, but the bond isn't what makes us unified. Right? You can have an employee card for whatever employer you have and find somebody else that works at the company doesn't mean that you, you have a bond you're a part of the same thing but it doesn't mean you're unified right? you can be an American citizen doesn't mean that you're unified with all the other American citizens in fact a whole bunch of them are dumb anyway I can't fix stupid but unity something more than just familiar relationship more than all that unity is you being so in touch with God and everybody else personally being so in touch with God that collectively we're in touch with God you know what causes all them details that people get hung up on to just disappear what, they strain at gnats and swallow camels you know what causes them gnats to disappear you just get unified with God it don't matter no more you start looking at things the way God sees them those things that the flesh gets hung up on, they just start fading into the background. You see what's important. That's what keeps people unified. 
Right? They can set aside those weights which does so easily beset us. And they choose to endeavor for one thing. What's that? A called out body of believers that actually reaches the community that it's in. Because that's the point of the church. That's why God put us together so that we would be unified so that the community could see a group of people that aren't affected the way that the rest of the world's affected when things come their way. And they say that it's not because of them. It's because of the one that put them there. So what do they do? They come to find out about the one that put everybody together. And hopefully, they become a part of it. And he puts them in it. Not, but unity. He says, without unity, you got to endeavor to keep the unity of the Spirit. Because without it, you can't walk worthy of your vocation. Without it, you can't show the meekness, loveliness, forbearing, long-suffering. Because right, without unity, you've lost your purpose. Unless you're unified with what he wants the church to be doing, you may be a part of it, but you're no longer a participant in the church because you're off doing what you want to do. Did you know that IBC is now on iTunes, TuneIn, SoundCloud, and Google Play? Head on over to your podcast provider and subscribe today. And as always, thanks for listening.